Glenda Est Carthago. Fortune now puts before us the most glorious of rewards. In whichever way this battle is decided, should we not be at once the most foolish of mankind if we abandon glory and instead deliberately choose the worst of misfortunes? Charge then the enemy with a steady resolve to do one of two things, to conquer or to die. The Punic Wars, Part 6, Delenda Est Carthago. Welcome back to Flashpoint History. This is going to be the sixth and final episode of the Punic War series. A war so long, it took me six episodes just to get to the end of it. In our last episode, we talked about how Rome managed to claw her way back from the brink, not only managing to reassert her dominance over Italy, but also her overseas empire, and then brought the fight to the Carthaginians by invading North Africa and this all culminating at the pivotal Battle of Zama, where we actually left off. Well, you know what comes next, folks, which is the obligatory plugs. If you find yourself liking what you're listening to, please give the show a like, or at the very least, spread word about the podcast. If you're interested in getting automatic downloads, subscribe to the series. And if you're coming at me from iTunes or Google Play, and you want to have your words immortalized, and you got yourself a little extra time, rate and review. Now, just as with the rest of the episodes in the Punic War series, there is a video component to this podcast that is available on YouTube, the link for which is going to be in the description of the podcast below. And finally, I want everyone out there to know that with the help of some very generous people, I was able to set up a Facebook and Twitter account for Flashpoint History. If you're interested in following us on Facebook and Twitter, by all means, again, that information will be in the description of the podcast below. Bottom line, folks, enjoy the show. So a couple of years ago, a really good friend of mine and I decided to take a vacation. He is a mountain climber, originally from Colorado, and his big thing is to climb the tallest peak on every continent. And I'm a big fan of Hemingway, and between the two of us, our agendas seem to cross with Mount Kilimanjaro. So we found ourselves in an airport in Nairobi, waiting for our connecting flight into Tanzania. And as one does when you have two to three hours to blow in an airport... You find yourself the nearest bar and you get yourself a beer. Now, while we're doing this, he comes up with this topic that to this day gives me pause for thought. He states that humanity has become the least barbaric it has ever been in history, especially within the last hundred years. And I thought to myself, there's got to be something really wrong with this statement. In the last hundred years, we've had two world wars genocide, holocaust, we live in an era of almost perpetual warfare, how can you possibly come up with this? So he tells me that he's been reading this book called The Better Angels of Our Nature by a professor of psychology from Harvard named Steve Pinker, and in this book he makes a very good argument that based on facts and statistics, murder rates, etc., that humanity now gets along better with itself than any time in the past, And the reason we feel that we live in a much more violent era than we do is because of mass media. Now, it's actually a very compelling read, and I'll I'll give you the synopsis. Quote, Tribal warfare was nine times as deadly as war and genocide in the 20th century. The murder rate in medieval Europe was more than 30 times what it is today. Slavery, sadistic punishments, frivolous executions were all unexceptionable features of life for a millennia, then suddenly targeted for abolition. Wars between developed countries have vanished, and even in the developing world, wars kill a fraction of the numbers they did a few decades ago. Rape, battering, hate crimes, deadly riots, child abuse, cruelty to animals, all substantially down. How could this have happened if human nature has not changed? What led people to stop sacrificing children, stabbing each other at the dinner table, or burning cats and disemboweling criminals as a form of popular entertainment? Was it reading novels, cultivating table manners, fearing the police, or turning their energies to making money? Should the nuclear bomb get the Nobel Peace Prize for preventing World War III? End quote. 
Like I said, this does give one a lot of food for thought. And one of the best examples that readily comes to mind of how humanity has progressed is the way that wars end now as compared to the way wars ended in the past. Take, for example, the way in which the Second World War ended in Europe. This was probably one of the most destructive wars in human history, and at the end of it, most of Europe was laid waste. Cities like Dresden, Berlin, I mean, there was nothing left. There are parts of Europe where people were literally starving to death in the streets. And yet, in the aftermath, you had institutions like the United Nations in order to oversee the peace, and you had programs like the Marshall Plan enacted in order to rebuild. Granted, there was a lot of political innuendo behind this. You know, a lot of people say that the Marshall Plan was done by the Western Allies to prevent Western Europe from falling under the sway of Soviet influence. And, you know, even myself, I, I buy it. But at the same time, you have to admit there was a plan for reconstruction in play, and it was enacted by people who are former enemies. There is a certain degree of enlightenment to this. Keep this in mind as we talk about the Punic Wars, and specifically juxtapose this to the way in which the Punic Wars ended. In the last episode, I talked, obsessively, about the way in which Rome managed to claw her way back from near annihilation. And not just that, she was able to reassert her domination over the central and western Mediterranean, but most importantly, she was able to find the answer, the military answer, to Hannibal's tactical skills and military prowess. Under the command of the Roman maverick general, Publius Cornelius Scipio, Rome was able to successfully invade Carthaginian territory in North Africa, and thus the stage was set for one of the most pivotal confrontations between arguably two of the greatest and, up to that point, undefeated generals of antiquity. Now this is kind of the unusual part. Both of these men were intrigued by the other. They were both military geniuses. They understood logistics and tactical maneuvering. They both had problems with their respective governments. And ironically, the one person that could understand them the best was their sworn enemy. This was going to be the beginning of a very peculiar bromance. According to the record, both Hannibal and Scipio met the day before the Battle of Zama in order to discuss peace terms. The historians even give us an account of what these two men said, but I think you need to take it with a grain of salt because a lot of this stuff sounds like Roman propaganda. According to Polybius, Hannibal was trying to weasel his way out of a fight. Now, does this even sound like Hannibal? Quote, It is about you that I am anxious, Scipio, for you are still a young man, and everything has succeeded to your wishes. As yet, you have never experienced the ebb tide of fortune. What then is the point that I am seeking to establish by these arguments? It is that Romans should retain all the countries for which they have thus far contended, and the Carthaginians should engage never to go to war with Rome for these. For I am persuaded that such a treaty will be at once safest for the Carthaginians and most glorious for you and the entire people of Rome. End quote. Yeah, right. You have Hannibal Barca, one of the greatest military minds of all time, coming across like a used car salesman. Scipio's response, I think, is equally Roman propaganda. You have to almost imagine Scipio standing on some sort of pedestal, you know, the wind hitting him just right so that his hair is fluttering and the cape is flowing in kind of a defiant manner, his sparkly teeth kind of thing. Quote, What then is the conclusion of my discourse? It is that you must submit yourselves and your country to us unconditionally or conquer us in the field. End quote. You just gotta love the arrogant defiance of all this. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, it totally reminds me of the encounter between the Greeks and the Persians at Thermopylae. You know, where the Persians came up to the Greeks and said, hey, you know what, we're going to be taking over your country and we just need you to lay down your weapons and we're all going to be cool. And the Greek response was Mulan Labe, which means Persian, if you want our weapons, come and take them. Of course, at this point, peace negotiations completely fail. I mean, after all, Rome and Carthage have not gone this long and fought this many conflicts in order to turn back now. And as far as Scipio and Hannibal are concerned, well, it's a very simple concept. Before these two men can be good friends, well, they got to attempt to at least kill each other once, right? The very next day, on October 19th, 202 BCE, which, again, folks, all dates are before the Common Era, unless specified otherwise. 
These two massive armies with their undefeated military genius commanders lined up on the field and the Battle of Zama began. Now the two forces that met on the field of battle that day were vastly different. According to the historical record, the Carthaginians had the advantage when it came to infantry, at least in number. When it came to quality, not so much, but I'm going to get to that in a second. The Romans, on the other hand, had the superiority when it came to their cavalry. And not just that, they were also backed up by the Numidian prince, now king, Massinissa. Massinissa, if you recall from my previous podcast, was a complete and total prodigy when it came to any type of cavalry command. Ironically enough, Massinissa started the war fighting for the Carthaginians and actually had a big part to play in the death of Scipio's father and uncle while they were in Spain. Now, this was a fact that Scipio was willing to overlook when he saw Massinissa's skill. I guess in the end, winning on the battlefield meant more to Scipio than any type of family loyalty. Now, as I'd mentioned before, Hannibal's infantry was not exactly the best. It really consisted of a bunch of different contingents that the Carthaginian government kind of smacked together, threw at Hannibal, and said, hey, you know what? Good luck, because you're going to need it. Goldsworthy actually comments on this, quote, the infantry in the center was split into three lines, mirroring the Roman formation. The first line was composed of Ligurians, Gauls, Balearic slingers, and some Numidians. This appears to have been the remnants of Mago's army brought back from Italy, Mago being Hannibal's deceased brother. The second line consists of troops raised for the defense of Africa, Libyans, and a strong contingent of Punic citizens making a rare appearance as a formed unit during the wars. The last line, held back a couple hundred yards behind the second, consisted of his own veterans, a mixture of many races nearly all now equipped with Roman armor and shields. End quote. Compare this to the Roman legions. These men had been trained ad nauseum for years to work as a cohesive unit. Scipio had done a masterful job when it came to their training. In fact, he incorporated the Cannae legions into his army. If you recall, these were the men that had been defeated at the Battle of Cannae and were put into exile by the Roman Senate for over a decade. These men had been waiting for 14 years for a chance of redemption. When it came time for that all-important pre-battle motivational pep talk, Scipio had to give one speech to his homogenous men, whereas Hannibal had to delegate to several different commanders in order to get his point across. Livy gives us a poignant, if not somewhat corny and melodramatic, description of the scene. Quote, There was a confused roar as his soldiers shouted encouragement to each other in a wide variety of languages, a vast army sharing neither language, culture, weaponry, clothes, nor appearance, and not even united in the reasons why they fought. The auxiliaries were there for the money and the prospect of plunder. The Gauls had their own special and long-standing hatred of the Romans. The Moors and Numidians were terrified by the prospect of a future tyranny under Massinissa, who was now no longer powerless. As for the Carthaginians, Hannibal reminded them of their city walls, the gods of their homes, the tombs of their ancestors, their parents and children and wives all cowering in terror. He played upon their hopes and fears, picturing for them two dire alternatives with no middle way between, either slavery and death, or else domination over the world. End quote. So, just to recap, this battle was brought to you today by greed, hatred, fear, and Carthaginian self-interest slash self-preservation. Any questions? Hannibal's master plan was to smash through the Roman center. You know, he didn't have the cavalry that he did in previous battles, so his chances of flanking and enveloping the enemy were almost nil. So the first thing that he did was send in the elephants. This was a tactic that worked really well against the Roman general Regulus when he invaded Carthage in 255, and he figured if it worked then, it's going to work now. But he was dealing with Scipio, and this was a game of chess. Both men could understand the other person's move three moves in. According to the record, Hannibal had about 80 elephants under his command, which was a lot for a Carthaginian army, which also implied that they were probably hastily put together and poorly trained. Now, the standard Roman army consisted of these packet of men that were arranged in squares known as maniples. Maniples had about 80 to about 120 men in them, you know, about the size of a modern-day company. The standard deployment consisted of arranging these maniples in a checkerboard pattern in three lines. The first line was known as the Hastati, 
Now, the Hastati were the younger men, and the theory behind it was that, you know, they were younger, more vibrant, more rambunctious, perhaps a little bit more stupid, and therefore much more eager to engage in battle. Now, if you managed to survive the Hastati, you were graduated up to the second line, known as the Principes, who were the men of prime age. And this was followed up by the Triari, who were men of the quote-unquote seasoned age, and their purpose was to provide kind of guidance for the rest of the men. Now, of course, the Triari and the Principes would also engage in battle as well, and as I had mentioned before, they were arranged in a checkerboard pattern, and the idea behind this was that if the first line began to waver or there were gaps that opened up, the second and third line could kind of plug those. So it was kind of a flexible offensive system. Scipio had the inclination that Hannibal was going to send in the elephants first. And so, instead of arranging his maniples in the standard checkerboard pattern, he arranged his maniples one directly behind the other in order to create these alleys between the men. Now, to prevent the Carthaginians from seeing what he was doing, in front of these maniples, he arranged a line of velatees, which were skirmishers, in order to block the view. Now, as the elephants got closer and closer, Scipio had his men sound their trumpets and bang their swords against their shields in order to create this cacophony of noise. Many of the elephants panicked and began to retreat. Those that continued on, Scipio had the velatees move aside to reveal the alleys that he had created with his maniples, and a lot of the elephants just simply went down the path of least resistance. The Roman soldiers on either side of these alleys were anything but passive. They were trained by Scipio to throw their javelins to take out the elephant drivers, and with that, Hannibal's great elephant charge completely failed. What's worse, the elephants that retreated smashed back into Hannibal's front line, taking out a good chunk of his infantry and smashing into his left cavalry wing, totally destabilizing it. Scipio, watching all of this unfold, recognized an opportunity when he saw one. And with that, he sent in all of his horsemen on both wings in a two-pronged attack. On his left flank, he sent in the Roman cavalry under his sub-commander Lilius to take on the Carthaginians on that side, and on his right wing, he sent in Massinissa with the Numidian light horse against, ironically, the Numidian horsemen that were fighting for Hannibal. Now, this wasn't going to be the first or last time in history that you have people of the same ethnicity trying to fight and trying to kill one another. You know, there's a great example during the American Civil War where you had this northern Irish brigade taking on a southern Irish brigade at the Battle of Fredericksburg. You know, this was a fight where when both sides saw each other, they were like rooting and hollering and yelling and taking off their hats and kind of, hey, you know, this is like recess for them until they figured out that, hey, wait a minute, these guys are the enemy and they had to level their rifles and start shooting at one another. In any case, the cavalry clash that occurred that day was fairly inconclusive. Neither side really gained much of an advantage, but Hannibal realized that this was probably just a matter of time. He knew that his cavalry was outnumbered and for the most part outclassed, and so he gave the order for his horsemen to evacuate the field, because he figured, he guessed, and guessed correctly by the way, that if he did this, he would draw off Scipio's men. And that's exactly what happened. The battle at this point, despite the military finesse and genius of the commanders on both sides, essentially became an infantry brawl. And the best way to think about it is in terms of a giant tug of war. Both sides had three lines of men. Scipio sent in all three of his. Hannibal only sent in his first two, keeping his canny legions, you know, his veterans in reserve. And it seems kind of like a dumb move, but Hannibal's plan was that his first two lines were going to weaken Scipio's forces, and then his veterans were just going to march in triumphantly and do kind of a mop-up operation. When both sides got into close-quarter combat, the fight went something like this, and again, think of it in terms of a giant tug-of-war. Scipio's first line, the Hestati, you know, the youngsters, smacked into Hannibal's first line, driving him back. Hannibal's first line retreated into his second line, who reinforced him, counterattacked, took on the Hastati, destroyed them, and pushed them back. The Hastati retreated back into Scipio's second line, the Principes, who counter-counterattacked, smacked into Hannibal's vanguard, and at that point, Hannibal's first two lines began to disintegrate. Polybius's account of this is, well, it's a little biased, and I had to paraphrase it in order to make it sound cool and make it flow. Quote, the whole affair now became a trial of strength between men at close quarters. The Romans, however, trusting to the steadfastness of their ranks and the excellence of their arms, still kept gaining ground. 
their rear ranks keeping close up with them and encouraging them to advance, while the Carthaginians did not keep up with their mercenaries nor support them, but showed a thoroughly cowardly spirit. The result was that the foreign soldiers gave way, and believing that they had been shamelessly abandoned by their own side, fell upon their own men as they were retreating. They now fought with even more desperation, and thus it came about that their charge threw the maniples of the Hastati into confusion. But the officers of the Principes caused their lines to advance. However, by now, the greater part of the mercenaries and Carthaginians had fallen either by mutual slaughter or by the sword of the Hastati. Those who survived and fled, Hannibal would not allow them to enter the ranks of his veteran army, but instead ordered his men to lower their spears and keep them back as they approached. End quote. Think about this. This is kind of like the Eastern Front for the Russians in the Second World War. You know, if you're not shooting at Germans and you try to retreat, you're going to get shot by your own people. The Romans at this point had the opportunity to really press the offensive. You know, they could have just slammed directly into Hannibal's veteran infantry. But I think if they had done that, it probably would have resulted in disaster. This is kind of what Hannibal was expecting, but Scipio saw this. And to his credit and to the discipline of his men, he was able to reform them right there in the field. But instead of forming the standard triple line that the Roman army usually did, what he did was he had his men form one contiguous line. The Hastati in the middle, the Principes forming up on their wings, and then the Triarii forming up on the extreme wings of that. Hannibal, recognizing the danger of having his flanks exposed maximized on this delay in battle and reformed his line as well. He did the exact same thing. He formed one contiguous line with his veteran infantry in the middle and the remnants of his first two lines forming up on the wings. What you had now was one long Roman line going up against one Carthaginian one. And a lot of historians debate about what happened at this point. Some argue that Hannibal started gaining the advantage, you know, drilling holes into the Roman line and actually pushing through. And who knows, if it had continued this way, this might have been a Carthaginian victory. But then Hannibal turned around and realized right then and there that this was going to be, as they say, an inauspicious day for the Carthaginians. Livy gives us the climax of the battle. Quote, that was the beginning of a completely new battle. The Romans now faced their real enemies, a match for them in quality of equipment, military experience, famed for their deeds, and with fears and expectations just as great as their own. But now the Romans had the advantage both in numbers and morale, since they already routed the elephants and having broken the enemy front, were challenging their second line. Livy, of course, is referring to the fact that the Roman legions are finally taking on Hannibal's veterans. These groups of men were both veterans of the battle at Cannae. Both were looking for a rematch and redemption. Livy continues, quote, At this critical moment, Lilius and Massinissa returned from a fairly long pursuit of the defeated cavalry and charged the Carthaginian rear. This attack by the cavalry finally broke the Carthaginians. Many were surrounded and slaughtered where they stood. Many others scattered across the open fields in flight, but died at the hands of the cavalry who in the end held all the escape routes. End quote. The Battle of Zama was now over, and this was clearly a Roman victory. The Carthaginian losses were staggering. 20,000 killed, another 20,000 captured, pretty much the entire bulk of their army gone. Hannibal managed to escape and eventually made it back to Carthage. Now, historians go back and forth whether or not this was a foregone conclusion that this was going to be a Roman victory. Think about for a second what Adrian Goldsworthy states in his book, The Punic Wars. Quote, It is impossible to know which phalanx would have eventually have prevailed if the Roman cavalry had not returned to take the enemy in the rear. Hannibal's tactics were not intended to surround and annihilate the enemy to the same degree as his earlier victories. He did not need such a complete victory. If Scipio had suffered a clear defeat then it most likely would have been the end of the African expedition, even if much of the Roman army had escaped. End quote. So the thousand talent question at this point is, why didn't Scipio take his forces, march him on Carthage, and just take it out? And I think the answer is that he probably couldn't have. Carthage was a massive city with impressive fortifications, and Scipio had a tremendous amount of pressure coming from the enemies that he had within the Roman Senate. You know, there was actually even a plan in play to have the guy replaced. 
so he wanted to end this war as soon as possible. And so Scipio did something that would make a future American president, Teddy Roosevelt, extremely proud of. He sent in the Roman fleet as a show of strength to surround Carthage. You know, this was the carry a big stick, walk softly, gunboat diplomacy kind of thing at its finest. This actually had the effect that Scipio wanted. The peace terms that the Romans wanted were pretty harsh. It started off with the Carthaginians having to give up all their war elephants. I mean, come on, you can't get any lower than giving up your elephants, right? But it did. They had to give up all overseas possessions. They had to acknowledge Massinissa's Numidian kingdom. And the Carthaginians had to pay a war indemnity of 10,000 silver talents, which I have no idea what that is, but it was a number so big that the Romans gave the Carthaginians 50 years to pay it off. What's more, Carthage could no longer have a fleet, at which point 500 ships were drawn out into the harbor and set ablaze. And finally, and most importantly, Carthage could not declare war on anybody else without Rome's permission. With the war fairly concluded, Scipio returned to Rome to celebrate a triumph, you know, a huge fiesta in his honor. Whereas Hannibal had to do the less than envious task of having to deal with the Carthaginian Senate. Hannibal being a military man, he was a pragmatist, and he knew that while these terms were harsh, it made much more sense to deal with that than to fight a war that Carthage just couldn't win at this point. And Livy fills us in about what happened in the Carthaginian Senate chamber that day. This is an encounter between Hannibal and a senator named Gisco. And I personally would have to say that this is a scene that a lot of people would pay probably good money to see. I mean, imagine this happening in the floor of the U.S. Senate today. Quote, when the envoys brought these terms back and laid them before the assembly, Gisco came forward and protested against any proposals for peace. Hannibal, indignant at such arguments being urged at such a crisis, seized him and dragged him by main force off the platform. This was an unusual sight in a free community, and the people were loud in their disapproval, to which Hannibal responded, I left you when I was nine years old, and now, after thirty-six years' absence, I have returned. The art of war, which I have been taught from boyhood, I think I'm fairly well acquainted with. The rules and laws and customs of civic life in the forum, I must learn from you. After this apology for his inexperience, he discussed the terms of peace and showed that they were not unreasonable, and more importantly, that their acceptance was a necessity. End quote. With the Carthaginian capitulation, the Second Punic War finally came to an end. Rome put Carthage on the back burner. She now had bigger issues to deal with. And Rome was changing. She was evolving. And this showed in multiple different areas. The militia system that she had was being replaced by having standing armies on multiple fronts. The tactics that her generals were employing were radically different. I mean, if you look at the stuff that Scipio pulled off at Olippa or Nero pulled off at Mataras, I mean, these are things that generals in 218, when the war started, wouldn't even have dreamt of. There was the development of a navy. There was a logistical system to back all this stuff up. Rome was truly thinking along the lines of a global, or at least a Mediterranean, empire. But here's the thing. You don't necessarily just need to take my word for it. Adrian Goldsworthy also comments on how the Second Punic War had this global mindset change for the Roman Republic. Quote, From the beginning, the Romans were able to produce in considerable quantity armies which were average in their quality and the skill of their commanders, giving them an advantage over all but Hannibal. As the war progressed and the Roman leaders and soldiers gained experience, their superiority over the other Punic armies became even more marked. Had the Romans not found the troops to fight and win the campaigns on the fronts outside Italy, then the outcome of the war would surely have been very different. It is to the immense credit of the Roman Senate that it continued to commit men and resources to distant theaters when disaster appeared to threaten in Italy. End quote. It's one of those things that once you start expanding into the world stage, it's very difficult to go back to being just a simple Italian power. The megalomania is already there. Now let's talk about what was going on on different fronts. Spain was kind of Rome's Afghanistan. This was a front that was almost in a perpetual state of war. Rome had to deploy several standing armies, and it was a very unforgiving front. You know, there's stories where Roman soldiers, if they let their guard down even for a moment, would get slaughtered. Another really difficult area for the Romans was Cisalpine Gaul. This is the Po Valley in northern Italy, you know, south of the Alps. 
the Roman Senate committed more consuls and legions to this area than pretty much any other, and the war with the Gauls was fierce. Many of the tribes were virtually annihilated, destroyed. The Romans, of course, would call this securing their northern border. In our modern era, you know, with the advent of such things as like the Geneva Convention, we'd probably call this ethnic cleansing, and I don't think you'd be completely wrong by calling this genocide. However, one of the biggest problems that Rome had to contend with was Macedonia and Syria, you know, its eastern front. But then again, who doesn't have problems with their eastern front? I mean, just ask Napoleon or the Wehrmacht. All right, we should probably start with Macedonia. Macedonia, if you recall from the previous podcast, was run by a Philip V. He was a king with a penchant for war. This was a man who picked the most opportune time he could find to declare war on Rome. Rome at this point was reeling from its disasters at Lake Trasimene and Cannae, and he figured he was going to kick him in the crotch while they were down. Now, the war between them was essentially a Greek versus Greek affair. You know, the Romans figured out a way to get the Greeks to slaughter one another and then sat back and watched them do it. At the end of this war, there was this uneasy truce between Philip and the Senate. You know, the Senate was busy taking on the Carthaginians, and they figured they're going to throw this guy a bone. They gave him an easy peace deal. Philip completely maximized on this reprieve. He started making deals with other empires, including Antiochus III of the Seleucids, who occupied Syria at the time. He started expanding his sphere of influence and began attacking other cities. He invaded Asia Minor, took on cities like Samos, Miletus, Pergamum, and this began to worry the other Greek city-states. Places like Rhodos and Pergamum actually started sending pleas to Rome for help. The Romans had to debate about what they wanted to do. You know, there was a big portion of the Roman Senate that didn't want anything to do with the Greeks. But the pro-war faction actually had a precedence. They stated, hey, you know what? There was another time in our history where there was a distant land, where there was an upstart that started attacking other cities, including a place called Saguntum. And you know what happened there. So the Romans decided to send an ambassador to the city of Athens, where they met up with the king of Pergamum, known as Attalus I. And it was that point that the Romans declared Athens and the Aetolian League as allies. Now, Philip V basically ignored this and continued to attack everything, including Athens. Thus started the Second Macedonian War. Rome sent its consul, Publius Galba, and he and his successor, Publius Vilius, made very little headway because they adopted this kind of defensive policy. But then Rome found the right man for the job and the war completely changed. Enter onto the scene a Titus Quintius Flamininus. Flamininus was a Philhellene. He was a big fan of Greeks and Greek culture, and he wanted Philip not to just stop attacking the Greeks, but he wanted him out of Greece and back in Macedonia for good. And so, in 198, he decides to abandon the defense-only policy and launches a full-blown attack on Philip and Macedonia. Now, when Philip realizes that this Roman is coming after him, and more importantly, that a lot of the Greek city-states see this invasion and start going over to the Roman side, he sues for peace. But Flamininus, his consulship is almost over, and let's face it, the man wants glory. And so Flamininus responds by asking Philip for these crazy, wacko peace terms, which Philip can't accept, and so the war goes on. Both of these forces meet up at a place called Cenocephaly in June of 197. And the reason why I bring up this particular battle is because it shows how the older Greek tactics of the phalanx are no longer able to keep up with the newer Roman tactics. You know, the triple axes, the three lines that make up a Roman legion with its built-in sense of flexibility and maneuverability. Cenocephaly was a surprise encounter between both forces. You know, but to be fair, there was a hill that separated them and there was morning fog that obscured the view. However, when both forces did discover that the other one was there, they hastily maneuvered their forces into position and went right into the fight. This was going to be a contest to see who could take the hill. Now, as I had mentioned before, this was a rapid deployment, and so the battle broke down into two distinct wings. 
the Romans on the left wing were actually pushed back by the Macedonians, whereas the Romans on the right wing were able to push the Macedonian phalanx back up and across the hill. And then halfway into the fight, a tribune on the right wing broke off with 20 maniples, wheeled them around, again, think Romans and flexibility, wheeled them around and smacked them right into the Macedonian right wing. Now, the phalanx was designed only for frontal attack. If you were able to attack it from the flank or even from the rear, you would demolish them. At that point, the Macedonians knew that they were going to be destroyed. Philip quickly recognized this, and he ordered his men to raise up their long spears, known as sarisas, as a symbol of surrender, which apparently was a Greek tradition, which I personally find very enlightened. But the Romans either didn't understand or <laughs> they just didn't care. And the Roman commander watching them do this figured, hey, you know what, with their spears up, it's going to make it really easy to kill them. Go get them, boys. At which point, the Macedonians got slaughtered. Flamininus managed to get his glory. And what's more, he managed to invoke some pretty harsh peace terms on Philip. Philip had to evacuate Greece. He lost territory to the Aetolian League. There was a war indemnity. He had to give up his navy. But I think Flamininus made a mistake. He allowed Philip to hold on to Macedonia. Philip keeps his mouth shut and keeps things quiet, but he dies in 179, and Macedon is taken over by his son Persuas, who, let's just say the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and Persuas is a hothead just like his father, starts creating trouble in Greece again. The Romans have to intervene again, and the third Macedonian war that breaks out between 171 and 168 is almost an exact rehash of the previous war. Perseus decides to take on the Roman army under the command of Lucius Aemilius Paulus at a place called Pydna in 168. Now see if any of this sounds familiar. The Roman legion, with its improved flexibility and maneuverability, does a tactical retreat, luring the phalanx into rough, uneven ground. The Macedonian line loses cohesion, at which point the Romans manage to outflank them and destroy them. But here's the difference. I mean, after all, you can only beat up on the Romans so many times before they learn their lesson. This time, they take Persuas into custody, put him into chains, parade him around in a Roman triumph, and then have the sense to have him locked up or executed. As far as Macedonia is concerned, well, Macedonia is no longer an independent state. It's well on its way to becoming a Roman province. And you know what? It only took the Romans three wars to figure this out. The Macedonians weren't going to be the only people to give the Romans a hard time on the Eastern Front. There was also the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucids were one of the successor states that formed when Alexander the Great's massive Macedonian Empire broke up into three parts. The leader of the Seleucids was a man named Antiochus III, who, well, to say that he didn't have very much love for the Romans is a bit of an understatement. This was a man that also had a habit of attacking a lot of his neighbors, including the Ptolemies. In 201, he engaged and utterly defeated an Egyptian army at a place called Panamum, which allowed him to complete the conquest of Syria in 198. This was going to be the same man who one day was going to shelter Hannibal when he was forced to flee from Carthage, but, you know, more on that just a little bit. Antiochus is somebody that I would have to say was a bit of an opportunist. He saw what was going on in Macedon and in Greece, and he realized that there were a lot of Greeks and Macedonians who did not exactly have a great deal of love for the Romans either. And so, in 191, based on this anti-Roman sentiment that was developing there, he decided to cross over the Hellespont and invade Greece. Of course, he doesn't actually call it an invasion. He calls it a liberation. And he sends out the call to anybody that'll listen that, you know, he's here to liberate the Greeks from Roman oppression or something along those lines. But immediately after getting into Greece, he makes a major faux pas. The historian Appian gives the account, quote, Antiochus marched against the Thessalians and came to Sinocephaly, where the Macedonians had been defeated by the Romans, and finding the remains of the dead still unburied, gave them a magnificent funeral. Thus, he curried favor with the Macedonians. You know, that's actually kind of a really nice move. You're coming into a foreign country, you find dead bodies on the ground, and you figure you might as well bury them in a dignified way. 
What could possibly go wrong? Well, give it a little time. Appian continues, quote, Antiochus then accused Philip of leaving unburied those who had fallen in his service. Until now, Philip had been wavering and in doubt which side he should espouse, but when he heard of this, he joined the Romans at once. End quote. This was going to be a downhill thing for Antiochus from this point onward. The Greeks got together and decided to oppose him at Thermopylae of all places. And yes, this is the same Thermopylae that 300 years before King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans took on the Persians. Except in this case, the Greeks were able to throw Antiochus back into Asia Minor. And at that point, the Romans got involved. The Roman Senate opted to send Lucius Cornelius Scipio, who was the brother of Scipio Africanus, you know, the guy that defeated Hannibal. Later in 191, as the Roman army was pursuing Antiochus after his defeat at Thermopylae, they were able to meet up with him at a place called Magnesia. Now, to make a long story short, the Romans were able to clean his clock. And just like with the end of the Macedonian War, the Seleucids were forced to give up territory, move out of Asia Minor, and to pay this massive war indemnity. It was 15,000 talents this time, which was even more than Carthage had to pay. Up until this point, we've been talking a lot about how Rome emerged from the Second Punic War in a completely triumphant way. You know, it was establishing this magnificent world empire. But what happened to our protagonists? What happened to Scipio and Hannibal? What happened to their bromance? The Rome that Scipio returned to was not exactly what I would call a very friendly environment. It was changing. There was this political conservative backlash against people like Scipio. You know, the older senators that had been there were not exactly happy with the idea of all these youngsters acceding to high rank too early in life, gaining too much power and popularity. And here's the thing, they kind of had a point. If you look at men like Flaminius, with his victory over Philip V, Lucius Scipio with his victory over Antiochus III, or Aemilius Paulus with his victory over Persuas, all of these men came back from their campaigns loaded. And this can be a very frightening thing for a government that bases its virtues on the ideals of shared power. So it really shouldn't come as that much of a surprise that there were political attacks left and right throughout the Senate chamber, especially against men like Scipio and his brother. These were led by a conservative wing of the Senate that was headed by a man known as Cato the Elder. The accusations that the Senate came up with were all over the board. They accused Lucius Scipio, who was Scipio Africanus' brother, of misappropriating funds during the war in Syria. They were particularly not happy with Scipio Africanus himself for defending Hannibal on several points. And they kind of had a point. How come Hannibal wasn't executed after the Battle of Zama? How come he wasn't in chains being paraded through the streets in some Roman triumph? I think in the end, the Senate was just not happy with the concept of their bromance. Now, Adrian Goldsworthy, again in the book The Punic Wars, gives an exceptional account of what happened during the trial of the Scipio brothers, and keep in mind the exact date that the Senate decided to accuse Scipio of his wrongdoings. It's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Quote, both men refused to answer the accusations and relied upon their past achievements and reputation to prove that they were true servants of the state. Africanus publicly tore up his brother's account books for the war to demonstrate his contempt for the charges. When his own trial was reconvened on the anniversary of Zama, oh, stab in the back, he declared that he intended to go up to the temples of the Capitoline Triad and give thanks for his victory. The mass of the court, apart from the prosecutors and their slaves, and all of the many onlookers thronging the forum promptly followed him, abandoning proceedings for the day. Despite this display of the charisma that had once inspired his soldiers and his continued popularity with the people, the prosecution was renewed and few senators actively supported the brothers. Africanus, depressed by the ingratitude of the state that he had served so well, went into voluntary exile. End quote. Scipio Africanus was perhaps one of the greatest military minds in history. And yet, political life destroyed him. Being hunted and persecuted by the Senate, he never returned to the public eye. 
and instead opted to stay in his voluntary exile, living in his private villa outside of the city until the time of his death in 183. According to the record, he made it a point to be buried outside of the city limits with the inscription on his tombstone, Ingrata Patria Neosequidea Mia Habeas, meaning, Thankless country, thou shalt possess not even my bones. Now, what is to be said about Hannibal? What is to be said about our other protagonist? Well, after the Battle of Zama ended, and the Second Punic War came to a close, Hannibal was elected Sufate, which is kind of like the president of the Carthaginian Senate. He came to power in 196 and realized right away that there was a tremendous amount of corruption, and what's more, most of the wealth of Carthage was being routed into the top 1%. Hannibal, being a man of the people, decided in 195 to enact reform, and his reforms were extremely effective. He was able to restore power to the popular assembly, he rebuilt most of the middle class, and he wiped out a great deal of corruption. It was because of the reforms that he enacted that Carthage was able to enter into a great state of revival. In fact, she was in such a good footing after a couple of years that she had the capacity to pay off her war debt in 10 years instead of in 50, even though Rome didn't allow it. You would think that this might have bought Hannibal some sort of re-election, but instead it backfired. The Carthaginian oligarchy, which was jealous of his abilities, not unlike the Senate being jealous of Scipio, actually went to Rome to complain about him. He was sold out by his own people. The Romans responded by sending in a delegation of three people to publicly accuse and denounce Hannibal. And the only person in the Roman Senate that opposed this action was Scipio. Like I've mentioned before repeatedly, these two men truly understood each other. They knew the potential of what the other could bring to the table. They both knew that they were exceptional for their respective governments, and what's more, they knew that there was a possibility in the future that Rome and Carthage could work well together. But when Hannibal saw this delegation of three showing up at the gates of Carthage, he knew it was a death sentence. And so he went into exile. He escaped from the city of Carthage and fled all the way to the home city of Tyre, and then from there to the court of Antiochus III in Syria. But when the Seleucid Empire lost against Rome, one of the stipulations of the peace treaty was to hand over Hannibal, and so he had to escape again. He managed to escape and fled to the court of King Prusias in Bithynia in 183, but he wasn't able to stay for very long because the Romans managed to catch him at this point. And Livy explained what happened. Quote, When Hannibal was informed that the soldiers were in the vestibule, he tried to escape through a gate which afforded the most secret means of exit. He found that this, too, was closely watched and that the guards were posted all around the palace. Finally, he called for the poison which he had long kept in readiness for such an emergency. Let us, he said, relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. He thus drained the cup, and such was the close of Hannibal's life." End quote. Hannibal Barca died in the year 183 before the Common Era, the very same year that Scipio did. But it is stated that before their deaths, these two men met one last time in the city of Ephesus during an embassy. They didn't meet as combatants or enemies or opponents. They actually met as friends. And Livy gives us an account of their final conversation. Quote, when Africanus asked who, in Hannibal's opinion, was the greatest general, Hannibal named Alexander because with a small force he routed armies innumerable and traversed the most distant regions. As to whom he would rank second, Hannibal named Pyrrhus. No one had chosen his ground or placed his troops more discriminately. When he continued, asking whom he considered third, Hannibal named himself without hesitation. End quote. But the conversation continued, and Africanus asked Hannibal who he thought would have been number one if he, meaning Hannibal, would have won at Zama, to which Hannibal replied, then I would have been number one. And if you think about it, this was a compliment to both men. <laughs>
The lead-up to the Third Punic War was a testament to Roman anxiety. The years between 200 and 150, Rome began to fear everything, including fear itself. Carthage was once again growing very wealthy and powerful, and there was this political conservative backlash, as we had mentioned, within the Roman Senate. Men like Cato the Elder were gaining considerable amount of influence. Cato is somebody that I would personally describe as, how do I say this nicely, the man was a total douchebag. You know, when it came to politics, he was great, but with anything else, not so nice. He was the guy that went after Scipio. He went down in the record books as saying things like, you know, when your slave gets too old, they become useless, and the first thing you need to do is sell them. He also had a distrust of anything that was science or medicine. He would treat his own family members to just absolutely horrible outcomes. And when it came to Carthage, he was probably one of the most venomous opponents there was. Now, just as it happened to be, in 153, Carthage started having more troubles with its next-door neighbor, Numidia, which was still under the control of Massinissa. Rome, deciding to try to soothe things out, sent a delegation to intervene, and Cato happened to be in that delegation. When he arrived in Carthage, he was impressed, but at the same time very much dismayed by the prosperity that he saw. The citizens lived in nice homes, there was wealth to go around, the people were happy. He didn't like this one bit. He figured Carthage should be ghetto at this point. The man was afraid. He feared the idea that Carthage could rearm and pose another threat to Rome. There was this famous scene that when he finally did return to the Roman Senate, he unfolded his toga and these three giant figs fell out. Now, of course, we live in a modern era where, you know, we have bananas imported to us from another continent. We don't think anything of it. But in the second century BCE... This was a big deal. He was emphasizing to his people that these figs are still ripe, and they came from Carthage, which is only three days away by boat. They could be on top of us at any moment. It was at this point that Cato started ending all of his speeches with his famous phrase, Carthago de lenda est, or, as I like it, de lenda est Carthago, meaning Carthage must be destroyed. Do you have any idea how annoying that would get after a while? People of Rome, I'm going to pass an agricultural bill, and Carthage needs to be destroyed. People of the Senate, we need to build a new temple, and Carthage needs to be destroyed. Honey, I'm going to go get milk, and Carthage needs to be destroyed. This brings us up to the critical year of 151, in which Carthage managed to pay off a war debt. She no longer felt any type of obligation towards Rome or any previous treaty, and Rome felt very much otherwise. Carthage was still having problems at this point with her Numidian neighbors who were constantly raiding into her territory. And so Carthage did the unthinkable act in 150 of rebuilding her army and attacking Numidia. As I had previously mentioned, the Numidians were still under the command of Massinissa, who was the last of the survivors of the Battle of Zama. This man was incredible. At the age of 88, he would still get up onto his horse and, without a saddle, ride with his men into a fight. And when he died at the age of 90, he left behind a four-year-old son. I'll let you do the math. This war was going to be an unmitigated disaster for Carthage. She fought and lost, and then to add insult to injury, she now had to pay another war indemnity, this time to Numidia. The Romans that were sitting back and watching this happen didn't care whether or not Carthage won or lost. What they cared about was that Carthage had the capacity to rebuild her army. Fearing this potential, Rome wasn't going to be messing around. The Senate formally opted to go for war in 149 and sent in the army, the navy, and both consuls in order to bring Carthage to bear. And as the city of Utica had recently defected to the Roman side, this provided the perfect entry point. The Roman army was under the command of a consul named Manius Manilius and the navy was under the command of a Lucius Marcius Censorinus. When both of these consuls arrived in North Africa, they started making these demands that were kind of outrageous, each one more progressively wacko than the last, and the idea was really to incite a war. The first demand was that the Carthaginians had to hand over 300 hostages of its elite families, you know, its aristocracy, to which Carthage said, okay. And then the Romans demanded, we want you to give over a ton of weapons and armor, to which the Carthaginians said, no big deal. And then the Romans had to come up with something really creative. So they said, hey, you know what, Carthage, 
You need to take your entire city, pack it up, every brick, every stone, every doorway, your city walls, everything, and move it 10 miles inland. Censorinus, the consul, gave the excuse that the sea, the Mediterranean, was a unhealthy influence. His take on it was that, hey, you know what, look at that huge body of water out there. If you put your foot in it, you're going to get wet. And ignore the fact that you could get trade out of it, you could expand your empire from it, you could provide for the wealth and nourishment of your families. No, trust me, it's all bad. Well, what do you do in a situation like this? I mean, Carthage was literally backed up into a corner. It had no choice but to declare war, and people within the Carthaginian Senate that continued to talk about peace were actually lynched at this point. The Romans, I don't think, knew what they were getting themselves into. This wasn't going to be a standard war where you had multiple different battles. This was going to be essentially a siege of Carthage. And the Romans actually showed up with a pretty impressive force. A couple of sources claim that they had about 50,000. Some claim they had about 80,000, along with about 4,000 cavalry. When they showed up with this massive army at the city gates, the Romans were actually surprised that the defenders just didn't give up. Adrian Goldsworthy gives a reason why, and this is, this is a little paraphrased. Quote, Carthage was a large and well-fortified city, surrounded by over 20 miles of circuit walls, difficult to approach, and with its own harbors, the city was very hard to surround and blockade, an especially strong triple line of defense based primarily on a wall 30 feet wide and 60 feet high and fronted by a 60-foot moat ran along the landward approach. There was accommodation for 300 elephants, 4,000 cavalry, and barracks for 25,000 soldiers. End quote. I guess it wasn't entirely surprising that the shock effect of having a Roman army at your doorstep wouldn't make you capitulate when you have these type of defenses. Ah, but here's the thing. The Romans decided to bring in their secret weapon. They brought in scaling ladders. And so... Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, the first frontal attack against these massive, almost impregnable city walls was a complete and total failure. The Romans, figuring that this wasn't going to be your standard smash and grab, decided to set up camp, and then they sent in another frontal attack, followed by another, and then another, and then another, and they were all literally bloody disasters. It was now time for the other consul, Censorinus, to give it a try. And his take on it was to build these two massive battering rams. And these things were so big that he had to fill in the pathways leading up to the city with rocks and dirt in order to wheel them up to the city walls. And to his credit, he was able to create two big holes within the city walls, but the attack that he led into these breaches were completely and totally misconducted. And most of his men were massacred. And then at night, the Carthaginians just came out and set fire to his machines. And that was the end of that. The Roman army and the commanders that led them into the field that day were not exactly the same type of caliber as Scipio and the men that he fought with at the field at Zama. If you try to compare them, the men in front of Carthage were a bunch of nincompoops. Almost all of them, except for one. In the Roman army that day was a man known as Scipio Aemilianus. He was the adoptive grandson of Scipio Africanus. This was a man that had fought at the Battle of Pydna. He had fought in Spain, which meant that he had learned his battle tactics in a completely unforgiving environment. And when the Third Punic War started, he came in as a tribune, which is about the level of like a colonel. But in North Africa, he worked at the level of like a general, there were several stories where because of his fortitude and his insight and his military audacity, he was able to save the Romans from themselves from complete and total disaster. And he did this again and again. The man, very much like his grandfather, was a complete and total virtuoso when it came to anything military. He distinguished himself to the point where he was actually praised by Cato. In fact, as the year 147 rolled around and the siege of Carthage had now been going on for two years, the Senate was looking for someone to bring it to an end, and because of Scipio's exploits, the Senate lowered the minimum age to become consul for one year just to bring him in. And so, in 147, Scipio Aemilianus becomes consul of Rome and returns to the siege of Carthage to assume command. He was hailed by the people who wanted to see another Scipio in North Africa. 
Emilianus was not somebody to waste time. He immediately deployed his forces to put pressure on the landward side, and that kind of occupied the defenders, and while they were occupied, he got to work blockading the harbor. Now, if you recall, the harbor in Carthage was kind of a wonder of the world. You could literally house hundreds of ships in there. He started creating this mole, which was like a dam to fill up the harbor entrance, and when the Carthaginians saw they could no longer get out that way, they had to tear down one of their own city walls in order to create a new entrance. Using this new opening, the Carthaginians sailed out one last defiant time to take on the Roman fleet. The battle that ensued was close, but when the Carthaginians tried to return to their harbor, they found out that the entrance was too small, a lot of their ships colliding with one another and ended up just bottling up the entrance. With that, the Punic fleet had to weigh anchor along the city walls, which made them sitting ducks. The Romans pounced on them, and with that, the Carthaginian navy was destroyed forever. Carthage was now cut off from the world, and the people inside began facing starvation. But our Roman commander still had to figure out a way to get inside, and he knew, based on the performance of his colleagues, that a direct frontal attack probably wouldn't work. And so Emilianus ordered his men near the entrance of the harbor, right along the city walls themselves, to build the equivalent of a permanent siege tower. Now this was going to be a massive undertaking. It began in the autumn of 147 and would take months to be completed. In the meantime, Scipio took a portion of his army, rode out and found the last Carthaginian field army, and near the city of Nephiris, destroyed it. The spring of 146 saw the completion of this construction, and with that, Scipio Emilianus gave the order that the city of Carthage should be taken by storm. His men poured over the siege works, they entered into the city and moved quickly. They took out the inner harbor, moved on to the Agora, and stopped only long enough to strip the gold from the Temple of Apollo that was located there. The resulting battle was this extremely gruesome urban warfare. Think of like Stalingrad in the second century. You know, people were fighting street to street, house to house, and in some cases the Romans and the Carthaginians were fighting room to room. The defenders of the city weren't exactly taking this lying down. They managed to inflict some serious losses on the Romans, but despite this, they were forced to fall back. And finally, they had to retreat to their walled citadel known as the Brysa. And it was here that the Temple of Aesculapius was located, and they turned this thing into a fortress. The historian Appian gives us a street-level view of the fighting that occurred, and it's pretty graphic. And this is, of course, paraphrased. Quote, Scipio hastened to the attack of the Brysa, the strongest part of the city where the greater part of the inhabitants had taken refuge. There were three streets ascending from the forum to this fortress, along which there were houses from which the Romans were assailed with missiles. The Romans mastered these and then threw timbers from one to another over the narrow passages and crossed on as bridges. While war was raging in this way on the roofs, another fight was going on among those who met each other in the streets below. All places were filled with groans, shrieks, shouts, and every kind of agony. Some were stabbed. Others were hurled alive from the roofs to the pavement, some of them alighting on the heads of spears or other pointed weapons or swords. End quote. This is what you would call doing it the hard way. Appian continues, quote, When Scipio reached the Brysa, he set fire to the three streets altogether. Then came new scenes of horror as the fire spread and carried everything down. The soldiers did not wait to destroy the buildings little by little, but all in a heap, so the crashing grew louder, and many corpses fell with the stones into the midst. Others were still seen living, especially old men, women, and young children who had hidden in the inmost nooks of the houses some of them wounded, some more or less burned, and uttering piteous cries, still others thrust out and falling from such a height with the stones, timbers, and fire, were torn asunder in all shapes of horror, crushed and mangled." End quote. The siege of Carthage was now basically a slaughter. The remaining inhabitants of the Brysa decided to commit suicide rather than being taken alive, especially the Roman deserters. If Rome ever wanted to make an example out of anyone, it would be Carthage. The massive fires were continued, which gutted the city. The city walls were destroyed, every building torn down, foundations uprooted, temples and tombs looted. The 50,000 survivors out of an otherwise massive city were all sold into slavery and dispersed throughout the Mediterranean. 
There is even a claim that the Romans decided to salt all the fields so that nothing would grow there for a hundred years. But I'm sorry to disappoint, the archaeological record doesn't actually support this last point. In either case, the Third Punic War came to a close, and Carthage was finally destroyed. What is to be said about the effect that the Punic Wars had on Rome and Western civilization for that point? I mean, you don't come out of a hundred years of struggle against a state like Carthage smelling like a rose. A lot of historians believe that there were precedences that were set during the Punic Wars that eventually led to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. I've read in places that if it wasn't for people like Hannibal and the struggle with Carthage that the Roman Empire would have never come into being and subsequently then it wouldn't have fallen. I don't quite buy that. I feel, and mind you, this is my own personal, humble opinion, that Roman imperialism was always there. It was a hardwired aspect of the Roman psyche, and that the Punic Wars greatly accelerated her expansion, along with the development of more standing armies, a navy, the logistical system to back all that stuff up. But to go into this in any type of detail is beyond the scope of this podcast. I will say, however, that the Punic Wars did set in a particular precedence that I think is very thought-provoking, which is a Roman commander or general who had the ability to win multiple times on the field of battle using audacity of movement would gain the undying loyalty of his men. And when you have a situation where Roman troops are more loyal to a Roman general rather than to the state— well, then it only takes a matter of time before you have somebody that you add in a little bit of political savoir-faire, and then you have men like Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, bringing down the state, and implementing a single-person rule. And a single-person rule is kind of like a two-edged sword. It's kind of sort of fine if you have somebody like an Augustus, or a Trajan, or a Hadrian, or a Marcus Aurelius. But what happens when you end up with a Caligula, a Nero, or a Valentinian III? What happens when you get somebody in power that has no idea what they're doing? A demagogue who has no ability to relate to the common person? Well, if history has taught us anything, this kind of event is just not sustainable. There was an event at the end of the Punic Wars which foreshadowed this. I'm going to let Polybius bring this home. This is Scipio in his final triumphant moment over Carthage. Quote, at the side of the city, utterly perishing amidst the flames, Scipio burst into tears and stood long reflecting on the inevitable change which awaits cities, nations, and dynasties, one and all as it does every man. This, he thought, had befallen the once mighty empires of the Assyrians, the Medes, the Persians, and unintentionally he quoted the words escaping him unconsciously. The day shall be when holy Troy shall fall, and Priam, lord of spears, and Priam's folk, and on my asking him boldly what he meant by these words, he did not name Rome distinctly, but was evidently fearing for her from the sight of the mutability of human affairs. When he had given the order for the firing of the town, he immediately turned around and grasped me by the hand and said, O Polybius, it is a grand thing, but I know not how. I feel a terror and dread lest someone should one day give the same order about my own native city. End quote. Well, that is the end of the sixth and final episode of the Punic War series. I really want to take this time to thank everybody out there for your time and for listening. In retrospect, for me, this has been a fascinating year-long journey into the world of the Carthaginians and the Romans, an entire year of research, reading, compiling, and writing to make the series that you now have before you. If you have enjoyed the Punic War series, please give it a like. If you are interested in getting automatic downloads, subscribe to the series. If you have a little bit of extra time, spread word about the podcast. And if you're coming at me from iTunes or Google Play, rate and review. Remember, your words immortalized. And as I had mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, Flashpoint History is now on Facebook and Twitter. If you're interested in following, the information is going to be in the description of the podcast below. Now, in our next series, we're going to be leaving the fascinating world of the Punic Wars behind and traveling 1,800 years into the future, where we meet up with a man named Hernan Cortes, 
as he takes on the Aztec. Now, I'm going to apologize a little bit ahead of time. It's going to be a couple of months before I'm going to get a chance to get back into podcasting. Life has a tendency to sometimes get in the way. However, if I do get enough responses, I will consider making a bonus episode to the Punic War series. Until next time, I want to thank everybody again for your time and for listening. Thank you.